Good afternoon everyone. It's my pleasure to have with us today Mr. Manoj Goinka. Manoj is the managing director of Triology Developers Private Limited, a leading real estate development enterprise. Under his visionary leadership, Triology has been built on the pillars of technology, sustainability, social impact and materials innovation. Triology as a company has established itself as a highly respected and innovative force in the real estate industry. Manoj has been instrumental in shaping Triology's strategic vision and leading the company to new heights of success. He is an expert in his field and their group has been widely recognized for its contributions to the real estate industry particularly through its impactful redevelopment projects that have added value to the urban landscape and improved the lives of many it's an honor to have mr manoj here with us today to share his insights and expertise please join me in giving a warm welcome to mr manoj goinka i welcome you sir a warm welcome to you sir mr manoj Thank you, Sonia. Thank you for having me on the program. Uh, Manoj ji, uh, as generation. I yeah, thank you. Welcome, sir. And as I understand, you had a transition from the textile industry to real estate development, and uh, particularly in the area of uh, redevelopment projects. What encouraged or uh, motivated you? Motivated you for this transition? So well. the transition was a post transition it was not a predetermined transition right. i was putting garments uh, all over the world okay. and you know, that had a very stressful lifestyle travel you know a lot of food habits no exercise and because of the travel the there was no exercise routine nothing right. so i felt sick and the doctor told me you have to change your lifestyle like you know? Okay. So the lifestyle is to stop traveling to this extent and be more at home, eat more home food and all these things. So we had no choice but to put that business. Okay. And real estate, real estate happened by by just pure destiny. Like one of my father's friends suggested to my father that he's out of this business now. Okay. Why don't you ask him to try his hand at the real estate business? Like I knew nothing. I didn't even know how to spell real estate. Frankly speaking. <laughs> I'm an electronic engineer, and then textiles, and then into real estate. So I said, let's start from somewhere, and we started supplying all the raw material that is required for a construction site, like cement, iron, box, steel, whatever anybody needed at the construction site. I said, okay, we will start supplying that. So at least I understand what's the raw material, what is the raw material all about. Like, so we started that, and you'll be surprised, Sonia. In the first year, I was supplying to nearly 55 sites. that's amazing because, quite good yes because the main thing which i realized uh, the pillars of business like there was no sense of timing there was no sense of quality and there was no kind of sense of pricing so when i got into the business i said no you tell me when do you need it what price you needed and what quality you need mm-hmm. and people thought i was talking some different language like you know and because we made the difference by supplying materials on time of proper quality the construction speed at different projects increased two folds or three folds like that makes a lot so of sense actually that so that was a huge learning curve for me and then when we started supplying material then i realized that there's no proper labor on the sites you know so mm-hmm. i said okay i have control on the material now i'll start putting in labor and i'll start building the whole building for you so we did that also and then i realized that why not i myself become a developer because the grass always looks greener on the other side so i went on to say okay fine i'll do my own projects uh, because i acquired in 3 years expertise on construction of the building so without putting much project on the uh, capital on the land we went to pune to a joint venture with some land owners over there okay. and we built around half a million square feet of residential apartments and it sold very well mm-hmm. and i was surprised myself because uh, we put in all the things that were required for the right project to be made what we need in a house 
and then i realized working so hard in pune doesn't give you that kind of returns so i said let me focus on mumbai coming back to mumbai we have mostly all old buildings over here because not much land is available in mumbai yes. and that time uh, the then chief minister mr devendra fadnavis came out with a policy saying that you know societies can read all of the buildings by themselves So I thought that's a great opportunity in doing that. So we went about going to the societies, helping them, asking them, we'll start doing work for you, raising capital for them, building for them. And then March 20, COVID struck, you know, as well came down and everything came to a standstill. But I believed a lot in that model because Mumbai, Mumbai needs nearly 40,000 buildings to be redeveloped as of now. So then post covid we started and thankfully god has been kind we were able to sign up some projects sign okay. up some funding and we are doing a few projects right now in mumbai so great. this is my journey from textile to real estate wonderful so um, how do you identify the potential redevelopment redevelopment projects and what factors do you consider when evaluating their potential so see real estate touches everybody's life whoever you meet whatever business he or she comes from or whatever field they come from everybody has a house at least offices house shopping wherever you see there's all real estate all around us like you know and fortunately unfortunately in mumbai we have lot of buildings which are old mumbai is a old city like you know it's been there for from independence time and at that time the buildings were not made of that good quality as mumbai is one of the cities where we have maximum high rises compared to other cities in the country sure. because we are a very land locked city we have water mm-hmm. all around us and it's a small island mm-hmm. so we see a lot of old buildings so there are various methods that we go about first the buildings have to be identified so we use a lot of uh, you know uh, broker network people go out in the market meet the buildings a lot of societies advertise in the newspaper looking for you know builders to come across and build for them and then i think the most important thing is word of mouth like suppose if i come to a building and say okay i'll be redeveloping the building for you you have a friend relative or somebody known who's living in some other building also who needs redevelopment so you know once you know that we're doing a good job for you then you recommend us and i think the word of mouth word of mouth is the most powerful uh, medium of marketing yes. uh, the earlier post- the earlier projects will become your brand ambassadors basically absolutely every minute body becomes it could do a great job for them exactly. and post covid what we have seen is that everybody wants to uplift their lifestyles yes one of the major things that we go to a lot of buildings and see like uh, i went to a building where the building looked very nice and i asked the chairman of the society why do you want redevelopment your building can last for next 15 20 years mm. so he said when this building was made we have 200 flats in the building and only five parkings yes. we have more than 200 okay. cars now yeah now in covid everybody had to park their cars on the road mm. and lock down so a lot of people came scratch the car uh, spoil the car hit the car so it's very expensive so one that's one of the reasons second reason everybody now wants to have at least a gymnasium in the building like you know where they can go down and to work out they don't have to go out to gym the third thing was they all wanted a small kind of a party room like you know where if there's a small birthday or an anniversary or a small like bombay ganpati is very big ganpati celebration so because of that also a lot of people want to go and party develop on our buildings plus some buildings don't have lifts they don't have certain facilities so I think it's a huge market like I cannot even put a number on it you can imagine if there are 40000 buildings which needs immediate redevelopment it's a huge huge uh, you know raw material level for exactly. us you know? exactly finding a project to do redevelopment is not so difficult uh, so manoj what are the what are some of the biggest challenges you face when working on redevelopment projects and uh, how do you overcome them So the biggest challenge, fortunately, unfortunately, is there's a huge trust deficit between the developers and the societies. Societies are not trusting developers to the extent that you know they would like to park their homes. See, house is a very emotional attachment for everybody. Like you know, whether you have a small one-bedroom apartment or a, a bungalow that you live in, and 90% of the Indians cannot afford to buy the same house that they live in. 
they have inherited those houses from their parents grandparents or from wherever it is you know so to create the trust is a very difficult part in mumbai there are at least 5000 buildings where the developers have taken up the project to redevelop it they have demolished the building and they have never made it again in fact the government is trying to find a solution as to how to bring those people back now that is like a big big amount of people without who houses like you know so there is a big challenge which first we have to convince them about that they can trust us we are the right partners because redevelopment is a process of 2 to 3 years it's not a process of overnight that i take a building break it and make it so you have to be patient like you know and you have to go through the whole process systematically and it involves a lot of stakeholders like not only is just you may do something right there are financial institutes there are people who will buy your product there are a lot of government agencies that you need to go to take approvals so putting the whole ecosystem together is a huge challenge like you know. so identify the right partner who will come in and uh, make the building for you that is where to convince the people is a very big challenge and then second thing is everybody expects a leg and arm in view of the building that is to be made a uh, member of the society thinks that the builder is going to make a lot of money from my project so let me see what most i can get out of it like that. so to try to bring them to a sensible level of what is acceptable to them also a challenge but it's okay we like going meeting people if somebody doesn't get convinced to what we are offering them we say no problem whenever you are ready you can come back to us we are waiting for you and success rate is hardly one or two person if i meet 100 buildings i get probably one or two projects in my hand but that's okay whatever comes in it's good because we keep continuously going on to it there's enough business available there. sure uh, i get every business has its challenges so you have to overcome those challenges from the other way right? uh, but tell me manoj like uh, balancing the economic viability of the project and its social impact can be very challenging how does how yes. does your company balance the economic viability of a project with uh, social impact so interestingly uh, first what we do is wherever we go we tell the society whether you give me a business or not at least get a right feasibility report made for your project so you know what is a potential available where your building is standing because every land is a different land different rules regulations different fsi models different heights there are so many things that are applicable to a building like you know. so we tell the society and the members first that give me an opportunity to just make a visibility report for you right. based on the visibility report we will recommend to you what is possible how much extra area you should be getting how much hard allowance you should be getting what kind of construction you can expect what type of amenities you can expect so we do a, a, with, with our experience we have a very good experience on what should be a right project cost that we should forecast i'm not saying that we are 100% correct because as you go by on doing the project there are a lot of things changes sometimes some government policies changes sometimes the cost of the materials go up sometimes you are not able to achieve the selling price that you have forecasted in the project but i think if we do it right and do the costing right and we tell the members that this is all what we can provide you in that if they accept that then i think we can create a balance in that so um, as you also mentioned that your work involves collaborating with a wide range of stakeholders from government agencies to community organizations to individual residents so how do you build that relationships with these groups so that the projects are well received and they have a positive impact on the local community as well so yes it's a, again a very big challenge because putting everything together and the biggest challenge is putting everything together within a certain time frame right because what happens is if you are not able to complete the project within a time frame the cost overrun also makes the project unviable exactly. so when like i told you that we make a feasibility report for a project we also tell them what is the timeline that they should be looking at okay? because if the project is not completed in the timeline the rents and the interest and all the other things also goes up like mm-hmm. now it's very important for us to keep all the stakeholders the government agencies and everybody together and making sure that they give us approvals 
they do the inspections and they do everything on time like you know so we try to keep a good relationship with them and one of the major things that we do for our projects is make sure that we work within all the rules and regulations of the government we follow 100% compliances we don't i tell my team not to even deviate 1% on the compliance that we are supposed to do be it fire fighting be it traffic conditions be it green norms be it water whatever it is because that's the first ethos they are building company that are built that we have to be 100% compliant so what happens is moment even the government agencies are seeing you create your own name in the government departments also okay this company always does the right job they always bring in the right papers we hire the right kind of professionals who understand the business and they also follow the same ethos like us like you know they will not try to deviate from the plans they will not try to shortcut some you know on the drawings on the costings on what documents we are putting up to the government department for approval and when we are designing and we take an approval from the society members on the plan we also unofficially send those plans to the government department to approve say okay this is what we are putting up if it's okay then we'll put it up otherwise we'll go back to the drawing board and correct it and come back to you like so it's not it's not a rocket science but if you just be honest in what you're doing and do it right i think keeping all the stakeholders together is not difficult the largest stakeholder would say is our financiers even when our financiers are seeing that you know when we do a good job i'm not saying problems won't come or mistakes won't happen but we own it up and we share it with everybody like you know if there's a mistake we have done we go back like i'll tell you one of our projects uh, when we started construction we the ground floor we took a wrong height of our floor and luckily i was at the site and i saw it and we stopped it but we informed everybody that we have done something wrong but we'll rectify you know, there's no problem so we're not trying to hide i'm not saying that we are foolproof we also are human our team is also human they can be mistakes but if you're being honest about it then i think everybody will cooperate with you taking right? the responsibility right take the responsibility and we go and we are upfront with everybody we also go to our different departments like we had a challenge where we had some trees on the project mm-hmm. and we are not getting up on the tree department to cut it down mm-hmm. i myself went to the municipal commissioner of mumbai and explained to him the situation i said look the delay is costing the project and it's not costing me it's costing the society members lakhs of rupees every month so i would request you to help me out and do it and i think he saw the honesty in what i spoke to him and he straight away within 24 hours approved my file so you have to work hard and you have to be honest with your stakeholders like you know that is a major thing like i tell my team one thing very clearly like you know you have taken somebody's house you have broken somebody's house focus on delivering the house for them money will follow money is a by product if you deliver the house with the blessings with their with their support you will make money money you will make it's not a problem but you have to first make a house for them so when the whole ecosystem sees us doing this i think it becomes much easier right so that is how we are able to keep all the stakeholders together right so uh, manoj uh, sustainability is a critical pillar of your work and uh, how do you ensure that your redevelopment projects are environmentally responsible sustainable and uh, minimize their impact on the local system local ecosystem first thing what we have done in every project that i have done is we have green consultants on board okay. they are very senior people on our board and they have complete ma- mapping of the sun of the rain water or the air on their hand like you know Okay. So every time I, uh, you know, architects design the project, we put it up to them to have a look. Because what happens a lot of time? Suppose we have light coming in from one side, we end to put up a wall there, and then we put artificial lights in the house. Water coming in from there, we keep a window there, so a lot of water comes into the house. So with mapping, our consultants helps us to make sure that you know the building is designed in line with, if possible. I'm not saying 100% we are able to do it. But if we are able to do it, then we first keep in mind all these natural resources are taken care of. Right. And then second, second thing is we make sure that all the rainwater harvesting, you know, garbage recycling, uh, water conservation methods, solar panels, all these things are, you know, inco- inco- incorporated by default. We don't keep it as an option. Mm-hmm. Then the next, the major thing about you know upliftment and uh, sustainability for the society members is earlier the buildings. probably just had brick and mortar and the building was made but today the buildings are much more than brick and mortar like you know like first thing is the lifts 
mostly you must have also seen in Delhi and all ground plus three, ground plus four buildings had no lifts. Mm -hmm. Today's younger generation doesn't even want to climb one floor without a lift. <laughs> they need a lift with that. So the lift, the air conditioning, the Wi-Fi system, the cable system, the water heating system, washing, uh, clothes washing, drying, everything is thrown into the project. Like, you know, because nothing is a luxury anymore now, Sonia. Like, you know, today, air it's a necessity, basically. become a necessity. At one time, if you had an air conditioner in the house, they thought you are having a luxurious life, like, you know. But today, Wi-Fi, like today my driver also first demands Wi-Fi from me in the yeah. office. Everybody wants Wi-Fi, cable, TV and everything like, you know. So we we have made this as an SOP in our system. Like if we are designing a building, it automatically goes with the top the thing. Like I'll give you an example uh, of a project I did. We installed 138 air conditioners in the building. And every air conditioner was linked back from their disposal of the water into the rainwater water harvesting, harvesting system. It's the purest water which we waste. Now imagine 38 uh, conditions every day they pump out in 5 litres of water and that's the purest form of water which is being so we put it back in the rainwater harvesting system right now. These are the small things that we Second thing, also our green consultants ensure that whatever raw material that we are buying, we buy it from manufacturers who are also green certified. Like my cement comes in from a cement manufacturer like ACC who is also green certified. Right now. I'm not saying 100% all our material we are able to manage through being certified suppliers mm -hmm. but the aim is to see what maximize we can do to make sure that even our suppliers are all green certified. Mm -hmm. Like I never knew that glass that we buy can also be from a green certified factory like you know. Mm -hmm. so the glass that we buy in the project again comes in from all the green certified vendors like you know. So we try to do this. I think we are responsible for our children to give them a better atmosphere and a better uh, you know, life. Better air quality. Mumbai, I think, presently is facing the second worst air quality in the world, not only in India. Yeah, <laughs> so I think definitely. So I think it's you have to be responsible. I was at a conference in Ahmedabad, mm -hmm. and all the builders and the architects on the panel were saying, Government should do this for us, government should do that for us. I said, Government will do nothing. What are you doing for yourself? Okay. Why don't you why don't you incorporate this in yourself? Like you know, why are you waiting for the government to come and tell you that if you need to install all these things then you need to make an again building like you know? So that is what we incorporate. I keep telling my team that try to see what more you can do to make a building. Because we have to look at uh, if I'm making a building today, it's for next fifty years. Mm -hmm. So Maybe. the world is changing very fast, you know, it changes every day. So next fifty years you don't know whether we'll have water left on this planet or there will be fresh air left on this planet. So we have to be very careful with what we are doing. You know? Even the materials that we dispose of from a site, like you know, whatever debris come out, whatever sand, mud comes out, mm -hmm. we are very careful in even disposing them off. Like, you know? We only go to the notified areas where the government has notified to dispose it off there, and we should make sure that you know it's been disposed of properly. You know? So these are the things that we try to make sure that it's a sustainable and a good impact on the society. Mm -hmm. But Manoj, when we talk about uh, technology, it is changing every day. So, now how do you stay up to date with the latest trends and developments in this real estate industry? And how do you incorporate this knowledge and technology to enhance the design and construction of your redevelopment projects? So one thing, uh, let me tell you, Sonia, is that building a building is a very basic thing. If everybody needs the same thing, like, you know? It's not something that you need something different or I need something. When you live in a house, everybody needs the same thing in a house. Like, the basic requirements are same, yes. Basic requirements are the same. Now, you know, technology, there are a lot of technologies which, are, which have come up. Like today, I'll tell you an example, like one of our projects, we are making it a completely a smart building, like, you know, where everything can be controlled from a mobile phone. Like you may be sitting in Delhi and if your apartment is in Mumbai, Sitting there, you can even see who's coming into your apartment, who's going out of your apartment. You can lock your apartment, unlock your apartment from there. You can put in all the electronics like air condition, Wi Fi, cable TVs, your air conditioner, uh, your TVs, refrigerators. Everything can become, uh, you know, remotely controlled. Mm -hmm. You can decide when to give access and who not to give access. So, these kind of technologies are now available. So, it's called smart homes. Like, even you know when your car comes in automatically your doors open after covid we are working we are trying to work with some software companies to make it a touchless uh, 
entry to your house, right from the entrance of the building to coming to your home. Don't touch anything. Everything is there on your phone. You come into the lift, the lift takes you automatically to the floor that you want to go on. So a lot of things we are trying to do. So we keep visiting a lot of exhibitions. I keep traveling overseas, seeing different countries, different projects. And of course, a lot of internet based information. I try to also go to a lot of uh, non real estate uh, conferences and exhibitions, you know. Like, I take real estate to be like the FMCG product, like that. We have to treat it on the same lines. So, there's enough of information technology that is available. It is only as to what extent you want to go for, like that. And we try to interrupt it as much as. So we have to also keep in mind the cost factors because these are all redeveloped and buildings. We cannot go completely wild by imagination and put in everything. Right? So like earlier we discussed that there is a feasibility that we make and we need to balance it out and we try to balance it to that extent. Right? So this is how we try to make all these things. Yeah, so uh, with the real estate industry rapidly evolving, uh, how do you stay inspired and uh, motivated to continue pushing the boundaries and pursuing new opportunities. Frankly, I'll tell you something. Yeah. When I see a family smiling that they got their house delivered of good quality, that gives me a lot of motivation to go ahead more biggest and more. Inspiration. Yes. That I think is the biggest satisfaction because when you started, they were not trusting you. Mm. They didn't know that you make the house on time and give it to them of proper quality. Right. And when they get it, you cannot imagine how happy it is, like you know. And you become their favorite person for lifelong. Trust me. Yes. Like we are running, we are running delay one of our project once, and I called up and I told the guy, I told my marketing team to inform the customer that we are running behind schedule, mm -hmm. and he was a bit upset. I asked him, okay, tell me how can I compensate you now? Mm -hmm. He said, give me fifteen rupees rent per month for the delay that you are doing. Mm -hmm. It was a four month delay, sixty thousand rupees. And moment I said yes to him, I, I reimburse you 60,000 rupees. He was getting married and he invited me to his wedding in Nagpur. Of course, I couldn't go. I, I sent my CFO and they treated him like he's the best person on earth. Like, you know, he was and they told everybody he's the best doll. I had not even completed the building. I just accepted that he should be paid four months rent from my side of 60,000 rupees. So that is a factor which keeps me motivated to go more and more. And Trust me, they'll never forget you in your life. They'll send you a gift on your on Diwali or New Year or whatever thing it is. You know? it's so a that motivates. It's a relationship because, see, you're not trusting anybody right now to give a house, and suddenly somebody comes and you trust him for out of force because you don't have a choice. It's like picking the best devil, you know? and then you complete the house on time, you deliver it on time, and you deliver it with proper quality. Most of the people we go, they say, okay, there will be no water leakage in my house, the mm -hmm. paint will not come off, the tiles will not come off. So they are very scared, you know. So when you deliver that, that is the thing which motivates me and my team the most to go behind this Wonderful. and do it. Wonderful. Like I tell my people, I said, okay, whatever contract you signed, that's for paper. Mm -hmm. But it is your moral responsibility to make sure that you deliver the right quality, the right product, and on time. If I give you something after five years, it's of no use. Like so that is what motivates us to go more and more on this business level. Right? I tell all my colleague builders, I said, boss, just focus on delivering the house. Don't focus on making money. Unfortunately, a lot of us focus only on making money and not delivering the houses. Like right? So that is what uh, is the major difference. Like right? so, uh, Manoj, uh, how do you see the real estate industry? evolving in the next five to ten years and what do you think will be the biggest challenge or opportunity for upcoming entrepreneurs in this industry? See, as we all know, we are sitting at a three trillion uh, GDP right now yes. and government is looking at taking it to five trillion in the next two, three years. Hmm. It can happen in 24 or it can happen in 25, but it will happen sooner or later. Like, yeah. you know? Now, when it's growing, see what happened when our fathers or grandfathers, when they came into the cities, you know, they bought houses and they, so our basic foundation is made. Now we have to go from a smaller house to a bigger house when we are making more money, like, you know. 
that's why you think that uh, of late luxury items are selling so well mm. so we are going to grow uh, go up with the internet exposure everybody wants a good house good lifestyle money is available disposable income is available retail loans are available like in real estate there's a very famous saying 25 years back when a person was ending his career he bought a house you know today when people start their career they buy a house because the money is available to give them loans and money is easily available on retail loans so i think it's going to be huge in this business real estate in india is still far behind what we see in the western world mm-hmm. the quality of houses that we are making the products that we have and we all aspiring and we are copying the western world like you know so we want better buildings one thing sony will be surprised like the commercial buildings or the office buildings we have been building world class you know mm-hmm. around that we are the most modern offices very modernly made very well furnished very well equipped very green very safe everything is there but homes are still not reached there like yes so so there's a huge huge demand and earlier it was just the city like tier one city like bombay city bangalore where the houses were good the buildings were good but today you know if you go to a tier two tier three tier four cities when i go to cities like surat rajkot vadodara Suddenly, you see your much better quality buildings there, much good-looking building, much uh, well-equipped buildings. So, I think I don't see there's going to be end of uh, uh, like work for as real estate developers. You know? As long as we yeah, keep doing good products, so there's Youngster a huge opportunity. Yes. So, youngsters when they come in, they have to remember one thing: like you know, it's a, it's not an easy business. It's a very very tough business because. you are dealing with so many so many people around you like you know and you need to deliver well so it's, it's a hard business it needs a lot of capital also but it's a profitable business also i must say like you know if you do it right you can you can make a lot of money but if you don't do it right then you can lose a lot of money also like you know? and also what happens is if you don't do it right then the legal systems the local political system people a lot of people get involved if you're not delivering your house right if the building right you know because it's your lifetime lifetime investment that you lost so people are not going to go and you have to be very and these days customers are fully involved in the project themselves they are fully aware of what is happening and they are very educated and informative themselves <laughs> with all the new laws that government has got in regulating the real estate industry you must be aware that we have rera in this business right. now that the customers have a voice now earlier the customers didn't have any voice exactly. and i pers- if you ask me personally a regulated market is a good market than an unregulated market like you know? a regulated market also creates a lot of confidence in the customers to go for thing it makes us disciplined because we are answerable to the customers we are answerable to the legal system So I think there's a huge opportunity that one can tap, like you know. So much that is more where we are. Much disciplined, definitely. Mm-hmm. Correct. So uh, finally, Manoj, uh, what advice would you give to someone or a group who is considering redevelopment for their particular projects? I think it's simple work hard, be honest, mm-hmm. and make sure that you are able to mobilize all the resources to be able to deliver on time. that is a simple thing like it's it's not difficult like you know? and once you understand what is required then i don't think so it is going to be impossible to do it okay. that is what it is it's a wonderful session which we've had with you it's quite informative and i'm really grateful for uh, for sparing your time sir you've been here and thank you so much i really i'm grateful thank you thank you sir nice to meet you and thanks for having me over Look out to see you soon. Thanks, bye. Sure. Thank you, sir. Bye, bye. Take care.